All right, after uh, after our last speaker, if you have any brain cells left, <laughs> uh, you know, you know the, one of the good signs is w- when you ask for questions, if nobody has any, it means either they, they don't want to expose their inability to grasp the subject so they don't want to ask a question. <laughs> It's getting late. You've been here for a day, Louie. You're just... <laughs> He's fully recovered. Yeah, we're, we're glad about that. Yeah. All right. Well, our uh, last speaker for the day, this afternoon, before tonight, is uh, Dr. Tommy Ice. Tommy and I have been friends. We've been accused of many things together. We've accused each other of many things, but uh, we have uh, been friends since 19... 19- 77, September of 77. Your memories is almost as good as mine. <laughs> and um, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so we, um, we went through seminary together, and at that time, Dallas Seminary was beginning to transition, and we, w- we had a lot of um, enjoyable discussions with other students and faculty members about things related to uh, dispensationalism, things related to psychology, things related to philosophy of ministry, things like that. And, um, you know, we had a bit of a reputation of being uh, um, rabble-rousers. And, you know, this uh, proof that sometimes certain traits of the sin nature or trends may get passed on from generation to generation show up when children are born. And Daniel up here is Tommy's son, and uh, he is a graduate of Cedarville, and he has something he wants to rabble-rouse about. So we're going to give him a second to do that. Um, yeah, uh, like you said, I went to Cedarville. I graduated in, uh, in, in the class of 04 with a computer science degree. And uh, Cedarville, for those of you who don't know, is a small Baptist college in Ohio. And it's in the thriving town of Cedarville. And uh, it's been a very conservative school. They, In their doctrinal statement, they have that they're pre-trib and pre-millennial. And, uh, and Dan Ingram is a alumnus of that institution. I'm walking the aisle right now. There we go. <laughs> and... Um, uh, Dr. Gramacki is one of their more esteemed professors there that y'all may be familiar with. And recently, though, the uh, the presidency has changed, and they've taken a turn for uh, the theological left, and they're they're adopting a lot of postmodern and emergent church uh, trends. And uh, the first major step in this direction was to fire two tenured uh, conservative Bible faculty without cause. Um, and uh, that's been an ongoing thing that, that happened this summer. They also denied contracts for three other uh, faculty who are of the conservative bent. They've got people there now teaching um, the new perspective on Paul, or at least they hold to it. They may not be openly teaching it. They have people that question whether you can certainly know things with the Bible, you know, because of some of the arguments Charlie just listed, like um, uh, we don't really know with our linguistic model and all this kind of stuff. And it's just not the traditionally conservative school it's been. And my purpose in, in coming here is not to just be a rabble rouser, but to inform you all, if, because I know a lot of you are pastors, if you're thinking about where to send your kids, I would highly recommend that you not send them there until this issue is cleared up. Because <clears throat> I know friends of mine and my brothers, my brother was two years behind me, that are walking away from their faith because of this garbage. And, I mean, they're, they're being told they can't be sure that they're saved. Um, Dr. Uh, Mills is one of them. He's written, D.A. Carson spoke. He wrote a rebuttal to D.A. Carson's talk against the emergent church there. They're having uh, speakers such as Donald Miller and other emergent church speakers come to campus, and they're claiming, they're talking out of both sides of their mouth. They're saying, we're not emergent church. We're just trying to get the other side in here and all this kind of stuff. But whenever you ask them, well, who is counterbalancing these, they don't seem to have an answer. So I have three documents up front. You can help yourself. Um, the green one has a, at the last page has a 
link to my website where you can download all this and some other stuff. Um, the first one, this is an article by a secular journal that just covers colleges in general, and they're talking about the uh, the injustice of the firings to show you that it's not just um, someone that got their feelings hurt. I mean, this is a bias uh, or an impartial third third source. Uh, this one is a couple of letters by one of the fired faculty, Dr. David Hoffeditz, and um, it's uh, it's got three or four things, but basically it cites the fact that the administration is is abusing this whole process, um, and and he cites it from the grievance committee. He was recommended for reinstatement by the grievance committee, um, and then this final letter is written by actual Cedarville faculty with a combined service of, of 500 years. So the I mean, one of these guys has been teaching there for literally 50 years, and it's an open letter to the administration about. The, the problems that they see with Cedarville, and it outlines a lot of the theological trends that you know this conference and, and one similar to it are trying to to fight against. So, I really recommend if if you um, if you have young people in your church that you take these and engage um, them with this. If you're an alumni, make a call to the office, ask them about the coalition, the concern, tell them you know your concerns as well. So, uh, thank you, and thank you, Robbie, for letting me. Rabble Rouse. Yeah, thanks, Daniel. Okay, our speaker, uh, Dr. Thomas Ice. Tommy is uh, Tommy and I co-authored a book on spiritual warfare, and since then he has gone on to be well known as the uh, director of the Pre-Tribulation Rapture Study Group. And I know a number of you have had opportunities to go to Dallas for the Pre-Trib Study Group. It's a great conference, and so Tommy is, in my opinion going to be the greatest defender of dispensationalism, classic traditional dispensationalism, and the pre-trib rapture in our, in our generation. So, the greatest. The great one. greatest. The greatest. I bet that one professor was there when you were there, if he was there for 50 years. <laughs> Don't you think? Yeah. Uh, Oh, okay. I know, but one had 50 years. Dr. Fittenbaum was there, too, I He's a student. I don't know. I think so. But um, Robbie told me my main goal at this time. See, look at that. Here it comes. Woo-hoo. The earth dwellers of Revelation showing at a theater near you. They're everywhere. <laughs> uh, but uh, he told me my main goal was to keep everybody awake at this time. So let's get up there and do a couple jumping jacks to start off with, you know, things. But I'm, I'm going to be talking about, uh, you know, a interesting word. Those of you who have taught the book of Revelation, you know, I'm sure you did a study of some kind on the phrase, the earth dwellers. And um, it is a term that's used in the book of Revelation of those who are persistent unbelievers uh, throughout the tribulation. And it's used 11 times in nine verses. And, it, you know, you can, it's a major theme of the book of Revelation. And uh, we're, we're going to see here in a moment that um, one of the purposes of the tribulation is to test the earth dwellers. And so uh, this is a major statement uh, that I think many have overlooked as a purpose for the tribulation. And uh, we know that there are, are purposes related to Israel uh, to basically uh, bring in everlasting righteousness, the conversion of the Jews, and these kinds of things. But in relation to the Gentiles, uh, you have this statement in the book of Revelation, and where this phrase originates in the Old Testament in Isaiah 24, 25, and 26, the little apocalypse of Isaiah, which covers the tribulation and some millennial sections as well, uh, that tells us the purpose in relationship to Gentiles of the, tri- of the tribulation period. And uh, I think it's a key to understanding you know, the book of Revelation. And you have the paper there, on your disc, uh, and we see the first use of this in Revelation 3.10, you know, that passage that's famous for the rapture, right? 
uh, and most commentaries focus in on the first part of this, you know, because or since you have kept the word of my perseverance, I will keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell upon the earth. And so here you have uh, a a purpose statement for the tribulation because that hour which is about to come upon uh, the whole earth. And by the way, uh, people say, well, the, the church of Philadelphia, that was for them back then. Well, this second half of this verse isn't for the church of Philadelphia. That's the point. It's that hour which is about to come upon the whole earth, you see. So it it didn't apply to the church of Philadelphia uh, about then. You can argue about the first half of the verse applying to the uh, church of Philadelphia. But this is clearly, you know, you look through the commentaries, everybody takes this to refer to a statement to the tribulation because uh, it's very clear that whatever their view of the tribulation is, you know, whether it's 80, 70, you know, or whatever, it clearly refers to that period uh, known as the tribulation. And so you have these two phrases, the whole about to come up on the whole world, and then the second phrase, to test those who dwell upon the earth. And there, there's the phrase, those who dwell upon the earth, is the phrase that I think originates, you know, in the Old Testament uh, that is incorporated here uh, to do this. You know, the book of Revelation is John receiving a vision uh, about the future that he is supposed to verbally describe what he sees. And John, as an older man, was so steeped, I believe, in the Old Testament or as our good friend Hank Hennegraaff says, <laughs> he had the uh, music of the Old Testament coursing through his ears. Just thought I would throw that in. <laughs> uh, and when he sees these events, that, uh, and he's describing them verbally, he, of course, uses Old Testament phraseology and language that's collected and gathered from the whole Old Testament, especially from the prophets. And so that's why you can make this connection with all of these Old Testament allusions, as uh, Mark said, Mark Hitchcock said yesterday, never a direct quotation, but phrases and words and terms, allusions, all from the Old Testament is how he describes that. And so this, this is a wonderful thing that he did because Revelation, which is basically chronological in my humble opinion, uh, it gives us a framework to go and through these allusions to cr- uh, get a chronological uh, way to organize the, the Old Testament passages, you see, into sequential events in relationship to one another. And uh, so what you have is in chapters 4 through 20, you have 13 times the book of Revelation cycling from heaven to earth, heaven to earth, heaven to earth, heaven to earth. Why? Because the heavenly temple is where all of the judgments that impact earth originate from. And, and so there's, there's a emphasis that heaven is where the Lord and his will is located, if you will. And so believers are those that look to heaven, that are heavenly-minded versus the earth dwellers whose focus is totally and only on the earth, you know, in relationship to that, not recognizing a heavenly authority, heavenly rule, and the heavenly domain. And this is probably why the term earth dwellers is used, uh, because they are not interested in what's going on uh, in heaven. And so this is why Revelation starts in the future section, in chapter 4 onward, with two chapters introducing you to the throne room of God. Chapter 4, to God the Father, and chapter 5, to the Lamb, who is that person in the Godhead who interacts in history on earth. 
And so it is the lamb who is worthy to take the, uh, the scroll, which is the title deed to planet earth. And uh, it's now time for him to take back over planet earth in a direct rule sense. I always like to point out God sovereignly has ruled creation from the day in which it was created after the fall and everything. He's sovereignly in control of everything. But he is not exerting his rule in such a way that he restrains evil, for example. He lets evil go. Probably not supposed to walk around, am I, that camera? Um, you know, or anything. I used to, depending on uh, if I was up or down, bipolar, you know, uh, hop across the stage back and forth on one foot. I saw Benny Hinn do that one time, so uh, the crowd really liked it. Well, I tell you, I'm a little stiff now. I'm, I'm in my fi- late 50s, you know, so it's not like it used to be. Uh, but yeah, third, that's right. But never, nevertheless, uh, the, the picture is emphasis is upon God in heaven, bringing to earth the will of God through these series of judgments. And God, of course, is going to set up a kingdom of his visible rule where righteousness reigns. And in order to do that, he's not going to just have any old kind of kingdom. Uh, He's got to have a righteous kingdom. And in order to have a righteous kingdom, he has to have judgment preceding that. Just like you have to clean up, you know, the town before sundown, you know, or something like that. And get all those villains out of town. You know, he's going to clean up uh, planet Earth through a series of judgments that are just... And that's why it takes seven years, or, or the, the sequences that it does, because uh, he's, you have issues related to humanity as well as the angelic conflict going on. And you have all kinds of interaction between heavenly and earthly and angelic and this other thing. And so that's why you have the term earth dwellers, uh, because it shows these people who basically have rejected uh, the influence of heaven. And this is why the more God uh, judges them, the more they rebel. And when you read through the book of Revelation, not one earth dweller ever becomes a believer. And therefore the test, the purpose of the test is to vindicate that God is righteous and just in bringing this judgment, you see. And so at the end of each one of these judgment sequences, for example, at the end of the seal judgments, there's an evaluation. Uh, There's a pause in the bombing campaign, so to speak, Uh, and they do some recon to evaluate. And, you know, it says they would not repent, and they'd rather hunker down into foxholes in the caves, you know, and take the bombardment rather than submit to the Lamb who sits on the throne in heaven. And then you have the next phase of judgment, the trumpet judgments. And they'd rather, they would not repent of their sorceries and of their uh, uh, idolatry, it says, and their demon worship and all of these kinds of things. And he goes to the next phase, you see, and then they're the ones who take the mark of the beast and all of this kind of stuff. But let's look real quick at the Old Testament. Uh, in Isaiah 24, you know, this, this term is used in other places, but I think the eschatologically significant, for, for example, the term earth dwellers in the, in the Old Testament is used, you know, uh, sometimes of uh, people who dwell in the land of Israel. And so that is a you know, in different contexts. And so we're not talking about those particular usages. Or it may talk about somebody who sojourns or dwells in uh, another land other than Israel. But when you look at those that are referring to the, the, the scope of the earth, the entire earth, they have a global uh, context. And that's what you see in Isaiah 24. You know, the earth mourns and withers. Uh, the world fades and withers. The uh, 
exalted of the people of the earth fade away. And so there you have the term earth dwellers in the Hebrew there. Uh, and this is talking about a global govern, uh, judgment that's going to come during the tribulation period, I take it, here. And then you see uh, down to verse 17 where that term is used again. And it says, terror and pit and snare comfort you, O inhabitants of the earth. You know, so that's uh, the term there as he continues this uh, uh, dirge against them. And what's interesting is you go down to uh, about starting in verse 19, and it says, The earth is broken asunder, the earth is split through, the earth is shaken violently. Now, some people, like preterists, some preterists, not all, but some preterists want to make this the land of Israel, you know, the land dwellers rather than the earth dwellers. But if you read the overall context, it's clearly talking about a global uh, judgment, not just the local judgment in AD 70 or something, you see. Uh, and here you see the earth is broken asunder, the earth is split through, the earth is shaken uh, violently, the earth reels to and fro like a drunkard, and it totters like a shack. For its transgression is heavy upon it, and it will fall never to rise again. Now, why is the earth being judged? Because the earth was put under man's dominion, and uh, because man, and hierarchically, man was to rule over the earth, was to till the ground, and it was under his dominion. So when man falls at the fall and rebels against God, then God ca- curses the earth and causes the earth to rebel against man to show him uh, you know, that there was cost to rebellion. And so just as... Man rebels against God, the earth rebels against man, and so it is involved in judgment. You see, and so God, the earth groans, as, as Paul says in uh, Romans 8, waiting for the deliverance uh, from uh, Christ's return. And so here you have the earth being judged in this way, and that has this further connotation of the connectedness of unbelievers to the earth in this way. So it will happen in that day, verse 21, that the Lord will punish the hosts of heaven. And so here, here this, this sounds like uh, Revelation 19 and 20. And so uh, this is further vindication here in the context that he's talking about all the earth, not the land of Israel, as some try to say, because he juxtaposed to the earth here is heaven. Heaven and earth, and everyone agrees that heaven and earth in Genesis 1, uh, you know, is referring to the entire globe. And so because you have the host of heaven being judged at this time, this is not some kind of local judgment going on in Israel. So the Lord will punish the host of heaven on high and the kings of the earth on earth. So you see the relationship here. And this is exactly what we see in the book of Revelation, is it not? We see in chapter 12 where Michael the archangel casts Satan and his fallen angels out of heaven at the midpoint of the tribulation, as we'll see in a moment from the book of Revelation. And uh, then the second half of the tribulation focuses on earth because Satan comes down and he turns all of his attention now uh, to persecuting Israel, the Jews, to try to prevent the second coming because the the purpose of uh, the conversion of the Jews is that's what's required for the second coming. And so for, in order for them to be converted, they have to, or, or to call on Christ to rescue them, they have to be converted. Paul deals with that in Romans 10. How shall they call on him in whom they haven't believed, you see? Uh, and he's quoting... Whoever calls in the name of the Lord from uh, Joel 3, 2, I believe it is, and uh, says, How can they call? And that's a rescue passage at the second coming in the context of Joel. And he says, How can they call on him in whom they haven't believed? And how shall they believe if they haven't heard? And so he's using reverse logic back from the outcome of the call for rescue, the second coming, to the belief that has to proceed the rescue there in Romans, and then the messenger who brings the gospel, etc. And so here he's clearly talking about 
the punishment of the host of heaven. So that's not just taught in Revelation 19 and 20, you see. It's taught in the Old Testament. It's expanded upon there, and uh, they will be gathered together like prisoners in the dungeons, talking about the host of heaven, and will be confined in prison. That's exactly what you see in Revelation 19 and 20, is it not? Uh, them being bound. And will be confined in prison, and after many days they will be punished. Interestingly enough, the phrase many days would cover the millennial period. And so here you have a chronological indicator in the Old Testament that's talking about the, the kingdom or the millennium. And it's not, it doesn't say a thousand years here like it does in the New Testament, but it uses the phrase many days to talk about the millennial period. And so you have, uh, you know, progressive revelation functioning in relationship to revelation for the kingdom. Here it's many days. It's going to be a long time. And later it's, it's appointed specifically to be a thousand years. So here's a reference to the millennium in the Old Testament. And he says, Then the moon will be abashed and the sun ashamed, for the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, and his glory will be, uh, for, uh, will be before his elders. And that's talking about the Lord's reign there for a thousand years, as is verse 22. And so we see uh, this interesting eschatological section here in the Old Testament in relationship to judgment on the heaven and earth. And that last part of chapter 24... I wanted to show you that it's talking about global judgment as opposed to uh, the land of Israel like some try to argue. And what a lot of these commentators do is they'll just uh, say, well, the word earth dwellers or earth or land can refer to Israel. And they go and they quote all the passages that do refer to Israel. And they're, they're right. There are many references, as we admit, that do refer to Israel. And then they just plug it in. And say, well, that, that refers to Israel there. Well, uh, so does the, the phrase, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, does that refer to Israel? No. And uh, so there are other passages that do refer to global, and, and this, I think, shows the global context of the earth dwellers that are being mentioned here. And then if we look forward to chapter 26 here, and uh, verse 9 we see, well, I'll, I'll do verse 7 to get the context. The way of the righteous is smooth, O upright one, make the path of the righteous level. Indeed, while following the way of thy judgment, O Lord, uh, we have waited for thee eagerly. The na uh, thy name, even thy memory, is the desire of our souls. And at night, uh, my soul longs for thee. Indeed, my spirit within me seeks thee diligently, for when the earth experiences these judgments, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. And so here you have, you know, uh, the phrase earth, and then you have, instead of earth dwellers, you have world dwellers, the Hebrew word for world here. And so it's, it's similar to earth dwellers, and earth is used in parallel in the previous uh, line uh, but they're called world dwellers, and this further supports the idea of a, of, a, of a global judgment rather than just a local judgment. And notice what it says. The inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness, you see? And, and that gives us insight into why John in Revelation, well, it was revealed to him is why, but nevertheless, it corresponds with Revelation 3.10 that the purpose of the tribulation for Gentiles is what? To test the earth dwellers. And here they're going to learn righteousness. And so here you have these, uh, th these insights into the purpose of the tribulation it's not just that God throws a temper tantrum and trashes the planet, you see, and makes Greenpeace real mad. <laughs> but I always say, don't worry, he's going to clean it up there at the end and won't require our EPA or tax dollars to do that. Uh, Though the wicked is shown favor, he does not learn righteousness. And see, that is the outcome 
of this. You know, if you look, for example, at one of the first journeys in the Old Testament into uh, the Gentile world, it's the book of Jonah, even before the Babylonian captivity. And uh, Jonah is the only prophet that doesn't have any prophecy in it, except for repent and then it will be destroyed. And that didn't come true. And so Jonah at the, you know, in chapter four is crying in his beer, sitting at the bar, you know, after he's done his thing and moaning and groaning and saying, I knew you were a gracious God, (laughs) you know, and kind and generous. You know, that's why he didn't want to go. That's what he says. That's why he didn't want to go to Nineveh because he was afraid they were his enemies and he wanted them wiped out. And, uh, so you never know if the earth dwellers might not repent as you have early in history with Nineveh because they repented and God was gracious. So this is why you have these tests of the earth dwellers to see how they're going to respond to the word of God. And of course, in the book of Revelation at the end, they aren't going to be like Nineveh. They're, they're not going to repent. And we know 150 years later, even Nineveh was judged in the book of Nahum, uh, you know, because they didn't repent after that period of time. And so here you have uh, the purpose of the tribulations. Uh, he does the, talking about, though the wicked has shown favor, so that's the hen, the Hebrew word hen there for, for grace. Same thing Jonah was complaining about, your God of, of favor or or. We translate grace, but it's more the idea of favor is a better translation. They're shown favor here, but they don't repent. He does not learn righteousness. He deals unjustly in the land of uprightness and does not perceive the majesty of the Lord. And so this, in this context, which is a tribulation, they're not going to learn the lesson. They are not going to respond to God's grace and, uh, you know, they are going to do this. Now, I don't, I don't think the earth dwellers refer to every unbeliever necessarily in the Old Testament. Uh, and it certainly doesn't refer to every Gentile because you have probably m- hundreds of millions of Gentiles getting saved in the tribulation from every tribe, kindred, tongue, and nation according to Revelation chapter 7. But these are just as you have the Jewish remnant who believes, the entire remnant believes, And the non-elect are purged out as multiple passages teach in the Old Testament so that by the end of the tribulation you only have believing Jews so that just as the nation largely rejects Israel at the first coming, the nation now accepts the Lord, a majority called the remnant and fulfills their destiny uh, throughout history. And so we see in verse... 11 here, where it goes on and says, uh, O Lord, thy hand is lifted up, yet they do not see it. They seek thy zeal for the people and are put to shame. Indeed, fire will devour their enemies. Uh, Lord, thou will establish peace for us, since thou hast also performed for us all our works. And so it's talking about that relating to Israel. And so here we see uh, further judgment. And then you go down to the end of chapter uh, 26, <clears throat> and we see in verse 18, it says, we, are, we were pregnant, we writhed in labor, we gave birth, as it were, only to win. In other words, uh, I guess that would be an uh, idiom for miscarriage. We could not accomplish deliverance for the earth, nor were the inhabitants of the world born. Uh, Your dead will live, their corpses will rise. You must uh, lie in the dust, awake, and shout for joy. For your dew is as dew of the dawn, and the earth will give birth to the departed spirits. And uh, come, my people, enter into your rooms and close your doors behind you, hide for a little while until indignation runs its course. And, of course, that's a reference to Israel, I believe, being hid away at Petra, you know, where they're there. And the Lord, it's using romance terminology here. He speaks 
uh, kindly and gently to her. He provides for her. She, she is converted. I think, I'll show you in a minute, I think she's converted before she even goes to Petra. But that's why she's hid away there and protected from this time of tribulation until indignation runs its course. And behold, the Lord is about to come out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth. And here you have probably one of the most important statements that relate to the earth dwellers. Here you have, he's about to come out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth. Revelation 3.10 says to test them. And here, this passage uh, knows the conclusion or states the conclusion or the end of the matter, uh, whereas Revelation 3.10 uh, st- states the purpose. So the conclusion is that they're going to fail the test, therefore it results in judgment or punishment, you see. Whereas the other one is at the beginning of the process where he's going to test them, and therefore the test vindicates their unbelief, and here it's talking about that, that they will be punished uh, for their iniquity, and the earth will reveal her bloodshed and will no longer cover her slain. And so we see the background for this concept of earth dwellers in the book of Revelation uh, is used here uh, and picked up by John. And so the purpose is, as we say, to test the earth dwellers. The next use we see in Revelation chapter 6, uh, 15 and 17, and this is at the end of the uh, seal judgments, and this is the evaluation part of the seal judgments that I mentioned earlier. And the kings in the, of the earth... And the great men and the commanders and the rich and the strong and every slave and free man. In other words, every uh, level or echelon of society is what they're talking about. Hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand? So... As I said, they'd rather hunker down and take the judgment of God rather than repent. Because in the previous section, the sixth seal judgment, you had, I think, a theophany involved when the scroll heavens roll back and uh, all of these earthquakes and things occur and they see the Lamb sitting on the throne. That's how they know to say that this is the wrath of the Lamb. And, uh, you know, they, the only way they can know that, because what's interesting is the first four seal judgments are man fighting man, so to speak. And those are the only ones of the 19 seal trumpet and bowl judgments where you have man on man. And that's why I'm not big on nuclear weapons and all this kind of stuff as part of these judgments, because once you get past... The first five seal judgments, the fifth seal judgment is the persecution of believers, which is definitely done by what we could call the earth dwellers. It doesn't state that specifically. And you get, then you move to the sixth seal judgment, which is supernatural, divine God, opening thing, coming from heaven. You see what I'm saying? Earthquakes and these kinds of things. And it's, and every judgment from that point on of the seal, trumpet, and bowl judgments are definitely coming from heaven. To man, and it's an important theological point, I think. You know, and that's why I, I think it's improper to interpret some of the trumpet judgments, for example, as nuclear exchanges and things, which would be man versus man. But it's an important theological point that this is God doing this. You know, was God able to nuke Sodom and Gomorrah? You know, before we developed nuclear technology, well, I think he was. You know, he was obviously. He didn't. He doesn't need us. And uh, what, what is called today uh, secular apocalypticism to help him out, he's quite capable of bringing this judgment for himself. So that's an important theological point here. And so that's why he's getting ready to bring all the judgments from heaven. And so he uh, rolls the scroll back and he 
sends judgments, and in conjunction with that, they get to see the Lamb sitting on the throne to show that is the source of where these judgments come. And that's why they say, who can resist him, you know, the Lamb sitting on the throne? See, later on, when they get all fired up about Obama, I mean the Antichrist. Uh, by the way, do you, know, do you know why Bill Clinton can't be the Antichrist? What? Because it says, it says in Daniel eleven thirty seven that the Antichrist will have no desire of women. So, even though he has all the character qualities, and, yeah, and people are tempted to make such a connection. I have provided you clear biblical reasons why he can't be the Antichrist. Now, Hillary, if she had a sex change operation, I don't know. Uh, no, I'm just kidding But on that, obviously. Uh, in fact, I, I, don't think, I don't think the Antichrist could, could be an American, frankly. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, there are people out there who rise to power and things do appear to be similar to the mindless crazed following that will characterize the, the rise of the antichrist you see and so that's the point later on in the book of revelation they're going to say who can make war with the beast <laughs> you know it's he he's a tough dude and of course the lord answers you know it's this guy it's this little wimpy lamb up in heaven. And, uh, you know, that's like Pharaoh asking, who is the Lord that I should let Israel go? He got a little ten-step lesson. <laughs> Martin, I think that's the, the real ten-step program there, the, the ten steps. And... Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, same kind of thing. You know, he got proud and puffed up. You know, God humbled that guy. And, and you, have the, you have a number of these throughout history. And the, the big one's going to be the Antichrist, who is at this point inhabited by the Satan himself and who wants to be like God. Good Democrat. You know, everybody's equal. It's all for democracy. We're all equal, you know, in this thing. And uh, so here is uh, the second mention of the earth dwellers, and they want to be hid from the presence of God. And by the way, that shows that the Lamb opening every one of those seals, that those are judgments from God. And so you can't do like some of these people, like the pre-wrathers and others, uh, to say that that's the wrath of man, but it's not the wrath of God. Because you have this summary statement of the entire seal judgment process at the end, and it's called the wrath of the Lamb, because he opened every one of those seals, as we find out in heaven. And he's the one initiating from heaven these judgments. And then, then you come to Revelation chapter 8, which is in the middle or part of the trumpet uh, judgment phases, 8 and 9, and I looked and heard an eagle flying in mid-heaven. You know, mid-heaven is where airplanes and birds fly. Saying with a loud voice, whoa, whoa, whoa. And here he's not trying to stop his horse. Uh, you know, this is a good Old Testament term uh, for the worst kind of judgment. You have the woes and the minor prophets and, the, you know, Isaiah and those other things. And so there's three woes here, woe, 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 to those who dwell on the earth. So here's our third use of earth dwellers, because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. And so the three woes are the fifth, sixth, and seventh trumpet judgments. And the fifth and sixth trumpet judgments are the demonic Trumpet judgments. Um, and the seventh trumpet judgment are the seven bowl judgments. And so the three woes are the, re the last remaining judgments 
that come down. And so you have the sixth, fifth trumpet judgment, which are the scorpion things who I think are clearly demonic beings who come up out of the earth. Abaddon is their leader. And, you know, I said earlier, you know, God's going to trash the planet, get Greenpeace real mad. Well, this is the one he's going to make it up to them. Because these beings who torment men for five months are not able to hurt green things. Isn't that great? (laughs) And to make them doubly happy, uh, they'll hurt mankind. That'll really make them happy. And uh, so you have, uh, you know, the green peace judgment, I like to call it, (laughs) of the scorpions... That, uh, that are demonic creatures who come to torment. Now, why does God do this to the earth dwellers? Because he's given them a little face time with the guys that they're going to get to spend eternity t- with. In other words, you like demons? You Okay, great. You like idolatry? Great. I'll introduce you to the guys behind idolatry, the personalities. They're demons. And let's see you'll get to have a little fellowship with these guys. (laughs) And that is a warning, a judgmental warning to them uh, about, you know, repenting. You know, it should motivate a person to realize, hey, if I don't repent and accept Jesus Christ as my Savior, then I'm going to get to spend eternity with these guys. And so that's the logic of that. And then after that comes... The six seal judgment, which are the 200 million man army, which are not Chinamen. By the way, the fifth seal judgment wasn't Cobra helicopters either, as a certain person that used to dwell in this city said in one of his famous books. Nor has it been upgraded to Apache longbows. Or Russian hind helicopters. Those are mean looking, aren't they? I mean, they look mean, those Russian hind helicopters. But, uh, you know, they're demonic beings. And, and neither are the 200 million man army Chinamen. They're, they're not humans. They're demonic as well. And that's the whole point. Every one of the six trumpet judgments are angelically administered and relate to angels and that's probably why you have one-third of the earth, one-third of the is dark, and one-third probably somehow relates, I don't know how, to the one-third of the fallen angels. If you see, it's a partial judgment, uh, and all of these are similar to the plagues in the book of uh, in, in, in the uh, Exodus. And then you have the full force of the final judgments, the bold judgments, which kind of repeat these to some extent, you know, in their fullness. And so the, the, thir- the third woe is the bold judgments. And in chapter 11, it says, And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry, and they will send gifts to one another, because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. And so here, this is one of the reasons why I think the two witnesses have to be in the first half of the tribulation. Because uh, this is preparation for the mark of the beast in the second half of the tribulation. And the two witnesses, this is in the context of Revelation 11, where the two witnesses have the ability to call down fire from heaven if anybody messes with them. Or have fire come out of their mouths, more likely. And uh, therefore, they probably oversee the reinstitution of the temple and the temple services that the Jews get going again. Dr. Whitcomb has speculated in this area, and I think it's a, a good speculation because they are able to oversee this, and this prevents the Antichrist from going into the temple of God until the, after the two witnesses are gone, you see. Uh, and setting up their image there. And so God, it says when their testimony is finished, there in chapter 11, then uh, they are killed. So apparently God allows them to be killed. Uh, Then 
it's as and we see this passage here in, in verse ten that the those who dwell on the earth rejoice and make merry. I mean, these guys are so happy. Reminds me of uh, when Jerry Falwell died in the homosexual community. I mean, uh, you know, I, I teach at Liberty, and uh, we saw some of that stuff. I mean, they were throwing parties. They literally were throwing parties because Jerry Falwell died, and they were all saying he's burning in hell. You know, I, I tell you, I didn't think those guys believed in hell. But... Uh, <laughs> Uh, and this is the same kind of thing, but even worse, or similar to when the palace, you know, they murdered those eight Jews in the yeshiva last week and the Palestinians were shooting their guns and passing out candy, same kind of thing uh, going on there. And so they're making merry and they will send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Tormented them? Yeah. Because they were abating the progress, or what they thought is progress, of what they want to do to take over the temple of God, you see there. And it's in that context. And then we see, I don't have this written, so let me, let me turn in my Bible. I think Garner, Ted Armstrong, you say in your Bible. Um, used to hear him, on t- watch him on TV. Um, And what we see here at the end of chapter 11, and after the, uh, okay, no, we got it. I got it right here. Yeah, okay. And they heard a, a voice from heaven. You know, I don't have verse 11. Let me read verse 11. And after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God came into them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell upon those who were beholding them. So their, their bodies are lying in the street. So what you have here is a recapitulation of the gospel in the lives of the two witnesses who are killed, rejoiced over. Their bodies lay in the street for three and a half days. They are resurrected. And then a loud, they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And so that's the, you know, similar to the uh, ascension. And this is where I think Israel is converted or many of the Jews in Jerusalem and Israel are converted at this point, right before the middle of the tribulation. Look what the rest of the passage says. And they went up into heaven in the cloud, and their enemies beheld them. Who are their enemies in the context? The earth dwellers. Exactly. And in that hour, there was a great earthquake, just like when Christ died. <laughs> You know, it was darkened and everything. And a tenth of the city fell. And 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake. Now, that's got to be some symbolic number. Exactly 7,000? Well, hey. Okay. And the rest were terrified. So who's the rest? Well, it wouldn't be the earth dwellers. It's someone other than the earth dwellers. And the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. And so I think that's where the Jews are converted. In other words, they feared God. They realized what's happening. It's a recapitulate the gospel, you know, and they gave glory to God. You know, how you give glory to God in this context, you know, I think by trusting Christ as their Savior. The second woe is past, behold, the third woe is coming quickly. Okay, and then you have chapter 12 where the Jews flee into the wilderness. And we know from Matthew 24, 15 that Christ says, speaking to a Jewish audience, when you see the abomination of desolation, which is uh, foretold by the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand, then flee to, to the wilderness, you see. Uh, so are you telling me that unbelieving Jews are going to follow Jesus' instruction, you see? I think they're believers. This is probably where they're convert. at least the Jews in the Jerusalem uh, area, the remnant that flees to Petra, where they are protected for three and a half years. And so I don't think the, the Jews, or maybe even a majority of the Jews, are going to be converted right before the second coming. I think many of them are going to be converted throughout the tribulation, 144,000 well before that, but others at this point. And so that uh, as we continue tracing the earth dwellers, 
we see uh, in chapter 13, because chapter 12 is uh, the, the fact that Satan is cast down to the earth uh, to persecute specifically the Jews. And all who dwell on the earth will worship him. That's talking about the first beast, the Antichrist. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of Lamb uh, who has been slain. And so here we start to find out that none of these guys are ever going to be saved. None of them ever repent. And further, I, I think this is, uh, you know, teaching election here. Uh, it's teaching pretemporal election because it says none of their names were written in the book of life. And people say, well, that uh, which is uh, before the foundation of the earth. Well, they say, well, that... You know, because of the uh, positioning of it in the sentence refers to the lamb having been slain from the foundation of the world. Well, okay, if you want to go with that, we've got a passage coming pretty soon that doesn't juxtapose it that way. And so I, I personally think, you know, that it's talking about election here. But verse 14 says, And he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which it was given him to perform in the presence of the beast. Now here, in verse 14, he's shifted away from talking about the beast, the Antichrist, to the false prophet. And here it's talking about the means that he uses to deceive the earth dwellers. It's the earth dwellers who are specifically deceived. And so it could, it could be a reference to every unbeliever in the, in the tribulation. I'm not sure... You know, it may just be a subsection of unbelievers, I'm not sure. But certainly, whoever these earth dwellers are, whether it makes up all unbelievers of the tribulation or not, then they're certainly deceived uh, through the signs and wonders. You want signs and wonders? Great. Uh, then just stick around through the tribulation and there'll be all kinds of signs and wonders. And this, so this is the means to perform in the presence of the beast. And notice... Uh, it was given him, you know, and it talks about the authority or power given him. Now, I think it's important to go over, I'm not going to do it, to Second Thessalonians chapter 2 here, where it says God will give them a strong delusion through signs and wonders and all of that kind of stuff. So I think it's God that gives this temporary power for three and a half years. Satan normally doesn't have it. I think that includes the resurrection of the beast by God, for the very purpose of deceiving the earth dwellers, the, the unbelievers here. Satan does not have the power to create or resurrect, but God gives them authority for three and a half years, as the text says here in Revelation. For what? The purpose of doing this. Why? To test them. See? You know, they're not going to believe the word of God. You had that in chapter 11. You had the two witnesses, you know, and, and they, you had the miracles occur uh, to demonstrate the gospel in chapter 11, and they wouldn't believe, right? So great. He's going to do some miracles, uh, you know, to help deceive them, to harden them, just like God did with Pharaoh. Same thing. He's hardening these guys by exposing them to the word of God, and it's hardening their hearts into unbelief telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had the wound of the sword who has come to life. You know, and as uh, Greg Harris at our pre-trib thing demonstrated, he wrote his doctoral dissertation at Dallas Seminary on this, his professor at Master's Seminary, you know, showing that this is the same exact language that's used of Christ's resurrection. And Hank Hanegraaff says, well, the, you know, uh, he criticizes Tim LaHaye, you know, uh, there may be some good reasons to criticize Tim LaHaye, but this is not one of them, uh, where uh, they say that, uh, you know, Tim LaHaye, uh, because he believes that the Antichrist will be resurrected, that that means you can't tell the difference between Jesus Christ and the false Christ because both are being resurrected. Well, it wasn't Tim LaHaye who put in this language in the Bible. Um, are we supposed to develop our theology from exegesis where the text tells us what happens and then draw theological summaries or conclusions? Or 
Uh, do we have an a priori belief of what Orthodox Christianity teaches so that we can uh, uh, say certain passages don't mean what they say? And so if, if you can turn Hanegraaff's argument on its head and show that you could argue against Christ's resurrection if you don't take this language of the Antichrist literally, you see. Because it's the same exact language in the original language uh, in both instances that describe Christ and the Antichrist. So if it doesn't mean what it appears to mean here of a true of a real resurrection, of coming back to life, then why would it mean that in reference to Christ? You see what I'm saying? So I, I think it means that, and I think the best way to resolve it is to go to Second Thessalonians 2, where it's God who gives them over because they love not the truth. And he allows them temporarily to do signs and wonders. Now, and uh, so this is, uh, you know, pointing this out in chapter 13 about the earth dwellers. And I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven in chapter 14. And so what you have here are the three angelic announcements. Once again, right before the middle of the tribulation, before the mark of the beast is being given out. And I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven, having an eternal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth, and in addition to those who live on the earth, the earth dwellers, to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. And so basically, I think the gospel is preached angelically to every human being on planet earth. Why? Because the mark of the beast is about to be given. And God is bending over backwards. So you've got normal evangelism going on after the rapture. You've got the two witnesses. You've got the 144,000. And now you have an angelic announcement so that you have a unique period in all of human history where history is polarized into believers and unbelievers before they die. You know, because today you don't know if Richard Dawkins may not get saved before he dies, right? He could. As a little boy in that movie said, it could happen. <laughs> and it's happened to some famous infidels down through history who have become believers later in life after mocking Christianity. I mean, it happened to the Apostle Paul and others down through history. But this is going to be a period where history is going to be polarized by whether you take the mark or not. And later it says nobody whose name is found written in the book of life will take the mark. And, but everyone who takes the mark, uh, their, uh, you know, their name is not found written in the book. And here we see that in verse 17. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to come up out of the abyss and go to, destru to d destruction. And so that's the Antichrist. And those who dwell on the earth will wonder whose name has not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the earth when they see the beast that he was and is not and will not come. Okay, what this is basically saying is this idea of wonder. They're going to be so impressed. I mean, when he's up speaking, there's probably going to be women fainting. That's the idea of wonder here. Uh, they're so impressed by the beast. I mean, this guy, oh, the beast, oh. You know, and they're going to have conniption fits and all kinds of things. They don't wonder or they're not impressed with the lamb, but the beast, they love that guy. And so everyone whose name is not found written in the book of life will receive that mark. And that's what this passage is talking about as well. And uh, oh, and so those are the usages of earth dwellers in the book of Revelation. And we know that, of course, uh, it talks about how uh, those will be spend eternity in the lake of fire, unfortunately, rather than the gospel. You have in Luke chapter 21 the phrase earth dweller used there in a similar context. And so this is a, a technical term, apparently, uh, that's used in the book of Revelation and in a few other places to talk about uh, unbelievers. And it gives us a whole theology 
of the spiritual dynamics of what's going on during this period, you know, the, of the tribulation. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, the payrazo is the purpose uh, for the, the test. Three ten. Yes, sir. Uh, could you teach us how? Uh, do you do you do a lexical thing where James one thirteen God doesn't pay rodzo? Is that two meanings for the word James takes one meaning and John's got another? Well, word. I do state in the paper, you know, that there are the two meanings, and that is determined by the context, and that this is clearly not, you know, one means to tempt, and the other is to test. I think it's clearly testing going on here uh, to demonstrate, for example, what kind of metal something is, you know. Is there a positive side to the testing, like a positive possible outcome? It's still like an offer? I, th- I think so in 310, you know, a- as it's used there. It's not tempt. The, the two options are test or tempt. But uh, so when test is used, then the outcome is not necessarily uh, known. But that's why I was pointing those passages in Isaiah where uh, you had similar statements uh, that were more confident or known. Because pro- probably there in Isaiah, it's because you know they don't, they're not using the whole book to trace this theme of earth dwellers like you have in Revelation, where, where later passages show uh, you know that they uh, if their name wasn't written in the Book of Life. You know they're not going to pass the test, and they wonder after the beast. Whereas that is just a statement about how uh, you know they're going to be judged. You know, on the on the outcome. Any other questions, comments, testimonies, prayer requests? <laughs> See, we had one decision. One guy walked the aisle earlier, even even before uh, the the t- yes. Comment about the two hundred million. Yes. And they're not having to do with men at all. They're just demons, in your opinion. Well, yeah. <laughs> because they're, because uh, they're under a demonic control there, and they do come across. From the east, the Euphrates River, you know, is dried up so that they can pass. But uh, I, I think if you read the text closely, it's pretty clear that they're demonic. They're, you know, described in that way. And and I was just saying in addition to that, it makes sense because uh, the summary statement at the end of chapter 9 uh, is includes uh, worshiping idols, idolatry, and the and uh, what's behind uh, idols all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament are demons. And so every one of those are angelically related, and uh, some of them are demonically related, which are fallen angels, you see. And uh, so I think that there's something about uh, angelic um, involvement in all of the trumpet judgments. Yes? The uh, scorpion uh, demons. Yes. Uh, the, are, are are they the ones that come out of the pit? Yes. Are Abaddon. Abaddon is their leader. Related to the uh, angels of uh, the demons of the, the fallen angels of Genesis six. Well, they could be. I think they could be, because uh, I can't remember. Does anybody know if they use the word Tartarus there? Is that because it says in Jude that they're put in or Jude or Second Peter? I can't remember. Uh, put in Tartarus. Reserved. Okay, it's only used once in Second Peter. Yeah. So, but that could be a circumlocution uh, in Revelation. There is a descriptive phrase that could be referring to Tartarus, in my opinion, in Revelation. But you know, I don't. I don't. I'm not going to say yes or no. But just it's possible because I, I'm not sure how to say it. But apparently, there are enough demons out there. Uh, to fulfill this task, though. Thank you. you. Well, since you let us out early, we'll probably invite you back since you didn't go long. <laughs> so that way they always told us to always cut short and people invite you back. You know, I didn't even know how long I had. I was <laughs> so so what else is new, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay, well it's four twenty. That means you get an extra ten minutes for the dinner break. We'll start at seven thirty. It sure felt like a long time to me. I don't know about y'all. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, we were waiting for the rapture. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Hoping out, for the rapture. Get out of this tribulation here. <laughs> okay. All right, well, let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for this day, for what we've learned. Thank you for these men that have uh, been here, the uh, fact that you have used them in so many ways, and they have devoted their lives to the study of your word. We pray that their example of such will be used by you to challenge other men to do the same, to serve you as faithful pastors and teachers, uh, feeding the sheep, studying your word.